All right, we're going to start with uh, coastal processes. Um, so coastal processes, we're going to first talk about one, what makes uh, coastal processes, what processes shape our coastline. Second part of this lecture, and it's going to be the bulk of it, we're going to go through the three major classes of coastline, those that are emerging, those that are dominated by sediment input, and those that are dominated by being swamped by the uh, waters overflowing in them. We're going to learn that there are processes taking place on multiple time scales influencing our coastlines. So I have them up here on this slide, we're listed in kind of order. We have tectonics. This is controlling whether your coastline is rising or falling, giving you rates on the order of about millimeter per year maximum. And the nice thing about tectonics is that you're in it for the long haul tectonics. Um, you're looking at things that happen on 500,000 year time scales too much, much longer. Then on a slightly more rapid time scale is the rise and fall of the ocean. This can happen at rates of uh, meters per hundred years during times when the glaciers are melting extremely fast. But presently it's a little bit slower though expected to pick up as we move deeper into this century. Um, local geology is gonna matter quite a bit. Also, your sediment supply. If you have a near the mouth river, your coastline is gonna have a lot more sediment uh, protecting it than say a coastline that is in a place not near any river mouths. Also, coastlines that um, get battered by waves more frequently are gonna be very different from those that are not batter waves. And finally, tides. Um, now some of these are gonna take place on scales of days, some of these take place on scales of hundreds of thousands of years. All together, they work together to shape the coastlines you and I see. And just once again to remind you, sea level has changed quite a bit, and the further back in time we go, the less certain we are about sea level rise. Just a little thought about this. You're looking back at this upper graph of sea level rise over the last 100,000 years, and we can see that as recently as 18,000 years ago, sea level was 140 meters, or almost um, four, over 400 feet lower than it is at present, and that it went down really fast, it's gone up, and that during the last um, interglacial period, sea level is actually a little bit higher than at present. Looking back even longer, we can see several periods of time when uh, sea level has been quite a bit higher than present, even by several hundred meters, and a few times when sea level has been just a touch lower, for example, at the end of the Permian. And there's some question as to whether there's been some other excursions of sea level, and you can see the further back in time we go, the less the experts on this seem to agree. Now what the point being that change in ice volume and stuff happening in the mid-ocean ridges can affect sea level by several hundred meters. That is not a small number. Locally, this means that the Coronado Islands might have been connected to, were probably connected to the mainland during the last glacial period. That we would have a lot of coastline that is exposed then, that is not exposed now, that was flooded as sea level rose during this time between the transition from the glacial maximum to the uh, present day. So what we're gonna look at is a coastline where the dominant process is tectonic uplift. Then we're gonna to go to a coastline dominated by tectonic uplift. Now, you may think what happens on a coastline dominated by tectonic uplift. Let's take a look. Dominant process on a coastline dominated by tectonic uplift is generally when you're uplifting mountain ranges, those mountain ranges are gonna divert any sort of uh, river around them, except the most persistent river. But uh, generally that's gonna block rivers. So you're gonna get very low sediment inputs. And as the landscape rises, you're going to get a lot of rock placed into the path of the waves. As the rock gets placed in the path of the waves, let's say um, 
the uh, waves are going to erode a little notch into the cliff face. Let's say we start out during the last ice age at a uh, sea level low stand. We're gonna see this uh, little notch be eroded in here. We'll cut into the cliff and then the cliff will, uh, this cuts under the cliff material will fall down the cliff. Over time, we're gonna grow a bigger and bigger notch. Your cliff is going to slowly step back over. Oh. It's going to step back over time. Then, when sea level rises, this cliff will be flooded. The floor will be flood. And then, what happens is, um, if sea level rises slow enough. This sort of whole structure will rise very slowly and follow sea level rise. And then when sea level falls again, you're going to get another little notch cut into the uh, hillside. So you get these sort of interesting sort of like stair step look to the landscape when this happens. You get a, uh, get a wave cut platform. platform, which is eroded salt flat by the waves. You get a uh, sea cliff. And then when these um, are raised up above any possible sea level for their future, they become known collectively as a marine terrace. So what we're going to do is uh, go over to our plot, see kind of a little bit more how these play out. So here we go. We have uh, so we're here down at Sun, uh, not Sunset Coast. We're at uh, Rio National Monument. We can see the modern wave cut platform is being scoured flat by the erosion waves. This, by the way, is during exceptionally low tide. We can see a sea cliff. They put a bunch of uh, rock in the place in front of the sea cliff to slow down the rate of erosion because they would like to keep these lighthouses and historic structures intact. But uh, if you ignore that, there's a very beautiful sea cliff here. And you see this sort of flat area. At one point, this flat area was this wave cut platform, some sort of different configuration of land and sea. If you look beyond this, you see the land rises very quickly. And then there's another little notch in the hillside. It's a little bit more steep, a little bit more subdued, but this is another marine terrace. And you have a uh, somewhat eroded cliffs. So you're seeing this sort of stair step look to the landscape recording the rising of the land and the uh, variation in sea level over a longer over various frames of time so these erosional shores because they have lots of put lots of land in the path of waves tend to have lots of wave energy and uh, you're going to see some variation of erosion on a smaller scale that's going to be a function of wave direction and rock competence in san diego the biggest determinant so Two big things determine rock competence. One, what is it made of? For example, this rock is not particularly competent. Uh, this is uh, along Sunset Cliffs in OB. And yep, that house is, these are houses falling into the ocean. They did try to put something they thought was more competent or some sort of like uh, spray plaster stuff. Horribly ineffective. I'm sure there is less house here today than there was in 2014, 13 when I took this pick. Here we also see in Bird Rock, this is a place where there's been heavy high rates of erosion because the rock's not particularly solid and uh, there's high wave energy that's constantly knocking out pieces of this. Now, if you're put on 3D glasses, you'd be able to count at least um, one, two, three, four, at least four marine terraces just on this hill alone. And you can see in sort of that this hilltop, now it's solid at, is rising substantially faster than the land around it. Um, in fact, what we're seeing in the land around it is we are also seeing most of these flat top mesas that make up much of San Diego. Those are also marine terraces. Terraces are just 
rising at a more steady rate. So pretty much anywhere you go in most of San Diego, waves have run across that at some point, and you're looking at primarily marine sediments. Now, the other thing that controls rock competence is uh, faulting and jointing. A heavily faulted and jointed rock will um, erode faster than that. So then uh, on an unjointed rock. So down at the Cliffs, you get where you have a bunch of faults in the rocks, you get all these really cool sea caves. As these sea caves erode further, they erode into natural bridges. And eventually what will happen is these natural bridges will collapse into what are known as sea stacks. Um, if you ever wonder how fast this happens, how fast they collapse, um, there are tales of hikers who walk across a natural bridge, have some lunch, hear a crash, and discover they're now sitting on a sea stack and have to be evacuated by helicopter. Yes, it can happen in the blink of an eye, not just geologically. So the point being that you're basically, when you're looking at an erosional cliffy shoreline, um, generally there's not a lot of sand. Most of the sand, much of the sand is probably derived from direct erosion of the cliff. Um, you probably have fairly strong waves here. And uh, your beach in the summer is gonna be different than your beach in the winter substantially. 